the uh, process of rediscovering government, I believe, begins with, with the rediscovery of the value of government, and then through that demonstration, a trust in government. I'm always reminded that Lenin said, and I'm talking about John, not VI, he said, uh, everybody says power to the people. And I kind of agree with that, but I never met a person I like very much. You know, I'm having a hard time believing in that system. And I, I look at the Tea Party developments of the last few years, and there's an awful lot that causes concern to, to all of us, but they seem to represent something that is uh, tantamount to believing, as Eric Schneiderman referred to, that it's not that government's getting smaller, it's that it's being misused. The notion uh, is equivalent to the fact that we have all paid dues to a golf course, but only the rich and the powerful get to play golf. And that's just not a very stable system over time. Herman Melville once said in his, one of his last poems called Clarel, that in the, the danger of having created in the mind or the spirit of every individual that all men are created equal is that when that is shown not to be the case, you can enter a despondent, what he called the dark age of democracy. And I think those of us that are here today are really working to uh, resist that despondency and to help regenerate an awareness of the value of government and regenerate a trust in the capacity of government to make all of our lives better and make a more just and equitable society. Our panelists today who uh, will cover a whole spectrum of issues related to taxes and growth can help us re examine and understand the value of government. When an anthropologist study a society, they often talk about the way in which you discern power comes from the blind spots. It comes from the taboos that nobody talks about. In a lot of our work on politics and economics, the idea that these are separate domains, that these are areas where uh, at some level, you're supposed to act in an economy according to your own personal self-interest, but as a member of society, as a member of a religious faith, you're supposed to be highly sensitive to the value of other people. These things don't sit next to each other easily. So when you look at our, uh, our political economy, which is an, an integrated, organic part of our, which you might call contemporary history, it's very important to look both across nations and, within, and over time at our own nation to understand how taxes and how various aspects of government expenditure and government programs affect our well-being. The bugaboo that comes from the right is that anything the government does is, quote, crowding out rather than what you might call uh, complementing the developments in the private sector. And I, I feel, as I looked and, at the panelists' presentations and have talked with them, that in this next panel we'll be able to discuss ways in which you cannot rule out the notion that government augments society and you cannot find a simple negative correlation between taxation and growth and well-being. And uh, I think one of the most uh, interesting dimensions, which we'll also explore in this panel, is the question of whether bad government can produce economic vitality in some contexts. Because it isn't always necessarily the case that what's good for society is good for the economy and growth or vice versa. We have three very outstanding panelists with us today. Uh, John Bakia is from Williams College and uh, a noted author on questions of tax policy. He and Joel Slimrod wrote a book called Taxing Ourselves, 
a citizen's guide to the debate over taxes, which was published in, uh, I think it's the fourth or fifth edition uh, in 2008. And uh, he's also written a book called, uh, <coughs> excuse me, co-authored a book called Retooling Social Security for the 21st Century. He's done a lot of work on health and uh, educational programs and, and their relationship to government. And I've been, uh, I think we'll, I'll, I'll introduce each of them in turn. So, uh, John, please uh, take the stage. <coughs> okay. Um, thanks. Just adjust this. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, okay. So, government has benefits, some of which are going to show up in measured income. For example, if government solves a market failure that enables people to make an efficient investment that they would not otherwise be able to make. It's going to show up in higher GDP. It's going to have some benefits like protecting people from risk through social insurance or uh, increasing social welfare by helping the neediest that are not going to show up in GDP. Government also has some costs and um, one of the primary costs would be that if we're going to set our taxes such that they're um, adjusted according to people's ability to pay so that we charge more to people with higher incomes, uh, that's inevitably going to reduce the incentive to earn those incomes. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about today is evidence that might help us learn something about the costs and perhaps some of the benefits to the extent they're quantifiable by observing, observing what happens to incomes and hours worked and things like that um, when we impose taxation. Um, so, now, of course, uh, we don't, ideally what convincing evidence would, would be here would be something that comes from an experiment. And obviously, we don't have anything like an experiment here. We don't have anything like a treatment in a control group where some societies were randomly assigned to receive a big government and others weren't. And that will feature prominently in my um, comments, not surprisingly. Rich countries have bigger governments than poor countries. Um, now, we can't learn much from this relationship about uh, the question that I posed at the beginning because there are obvious other considerations going on here. One thing is very poor countries don't have the capacity to raise a lot of revenue. They have um, corrupt or ineffective tax administrations. Uh, there's not much support for the government because it's often perceived as corrupt. Um, the government may be ineffective, so there's not just not a lot of demand for public spending, perhaps. Um, and there's a long literature that tries to study how the demand for government changes as income rises. And in, in general, it looks like um, as the income gets, as income goes up in a society, uh, people want government to do more. Okay, so that could explain this relationship here. Um, but it begins to point out how hard it is to figure out um, what the causal effect of taxes on income are. Okay, so one thing people have tried is to look at um, a more comparable group of countries, say limit our focus to rich countries. And here's the same graph for the group of uh, fairly rich countries, Europe, uh, English speaking, North America and Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Okay, um, so what this shows is the relationship between uh, total government tax revenue as a percentage of GDP and again, income per person. And the red line is, is the regression line. It just basically summarizes the mean relationship between these two variables. And you can see it's very flat. There, it's just the dots are all over the place. There's almost no correlation. Um, again, maybe we can't tell too much from this because of the two-way causality problem, right? But at least it's, it's interesting. I mean, if the costs of government were so great, it might show up a little bit more clearly in, in graphs like this. <coughs> Um, the next graph tries to look at the relationship between tax revenue and economic growth. So what I've done here is we have good data going back to 1970 on these rich countries. So I've divided the period from 1970 to, to 2010 into two halves, divided by uh, 1985. And for each country, I plotted the combination of the growth rate during that period in the economy and the tax rate over this time. Um, so tax revenue is a percentage of GDP. And again, you can see there's not much relationship. You have some countries, for example, all the, um, the red dots there are the Scandinavian countries and, and the diamonds represent the earlier period, the squares represent the later period. Income rises for other reasons, you demand more government and these two relationships obscure each other. Um, so that's possible. So 
Another approach that is sometimes used is to do the following. So here what I do is on the horizontal axis, I've got um, the change in total tax revenue as a percentage of GDP between 1970 and 1985. And on the vertical axis, I've got the change in the growth rate. So this is the change in the growth rate between the 1970 and 85 period and the 85 to 2010 period. Um, so the thought here is, well, maybe there are some characteristics of countries that uh, influence their economic growth that we can't really observe and control for, um, but we can, we can effectively control for those by looking at the changes over time in the growth rate, because those are unlikely to be explained by any sort of characteristics of the country that are constant over time. So looking at the changes in the growth rate, and another potential advantage of this is since, you know, essentially we're using the tax rate at the beginning of a period to explain the growth later in the period, in the subsequent 15 years, under the hope that maybe subsequent growth is not going to cause previous taxes. Okay, so it might help reduce the reverse causality problem a little bit. And again, there's not a very strong relationship. There is finally a little bit of a downward slope here. What that, uh, the slope of the line suggests is if we increase taxes by 10% of GDP, um, we would reduce our growth rate by a quarter of a percent each year, but the relationship is not statistically significant. The, you know, it's just a very noisy relationship and we can't be very confident in it at all. Um, so, so far, just looking at the aggregate data, um, there's not really clear evidence of a high economic cost of taxation, but again, we've got a lot of problems. So, um, economists turn to econometrics to get at this question, but it's really hard to get good convincing econometric e evidence through this top-down approach of just um, looking at aggregate economic growth and aggregate taxes. So, you know, we've already talked about the reverse causality problems. There are other reverse causality problems, especially having to do with recessions and business cycles. So um, taxes automatically go down when you fall into a recession because people fall into lower tax brackets and so forth. That's going to cause a spurious negative relationship between taxes and growth when it was really the negative growth that was causing the fall in taxes. Similarly, governments intentionally cut taxes when they're in the depths of a recession and the economy soon recovers, partly because of the Keynesian effects of the tax cut, partly uh, because of other reasons, like maybe the Fed cuts the interest rate. Um, and that's fundamentally different from the kind of question we're trying to answer and that I posed at the beginning. That doesn't tell us anything about the long run effects of taxes on growth. It just tells us maybe when we're in a recession, it's helpful to cut taxes, but it doesn't tell us whether it's harmful to have a persistently large government in good times of that. Um, there's also all sorts of other factors that affect growth. And so the econometric evidence tries to measure what factors we can and put it into a framework kind of like that graph, last graph I showed you. And, and essentially what they find is some reasonable sets of control variables, like if you include inflation, which might affect growth also, and, and some other things, you know, do uncover a negative effect of taxes on growth. But other reasonable sets of control variables, um, again, suggest zero effect of taxes on growth. And, there's not much guidance as to what control variables should be included, um, partly because, you know, sometimes variables that you can control for may be sort of absorbing part of the causal effect of government on growth. So, for example, if you control for uh, the level of corruption, and, and then what you're doing is saying, among countries with equal levels of corruption, do higher taxes um, reduce growth? Well, maybe part of the reason corruption is low in a country is because they put a lot of effort into building a good government, like they did in Scandinavia. And you know, one of the benefits of having uh, spending a lot on government is you have a highly paid civil service that will be less corrupt. So, so there's all sorts of problems here. And so, you know, there are some recent literature views that claim to say that, uh, you know, they think that the best evidence points to some negative effect of taxes on growth, but. But because it's so sensitive to what variables you control for, and because nobody really has solutions to these reverse causality problems, not, it's not super convincing. Um, so another tack you can take is um, the aggregate effect of taxes on the aggregate economy is really the sum of lots of individual behaviors that might respond to taxes. So um, another approach is to look at individual behaviors, such as hours worked. Um, so there's been a lot of research on this, whether higher taxes reduce work effort. And a lot of it suggests that hours worked are not very 
response of although the decision whether to enter the labor force at all may be, so for example, the earned income tax credit seems to encourage people to work. Um, but a lot of it not very convincing. Um, you know, so for example, sometimes we'll compare people with high and low after tax wages and we'll see that indeed the people with higher wages do work a little bit harder, not much harder in terms of hours worked, uh, but maybe they're just naturally hardworking people and that's why they have a high wage. So not so convincing. More convincing evidence looks at stuff that's more like an experiment. So for example, the Tax Reform Act of 1986 cut the top tax rate on rich people from 50% to 28% and didn't change tax rates much for people who weren't so high income. And we saw you know, no relative change in hours worked for the rich compared to everybody else in this Moffitt Wilhelm paper. So suggesting again, not very responsive. Um, the people who argue that taxes do have a big impact on work effort tend to point to the cross-country evidence. So, so here's um, a simple plot of, for the period 1997 to 2006, the average tax on labor in several rich countries that for which we have data and hours worked, and this is hours worked um, per adult in the economy. So it includes things like people who are out of the labor force entirely, that's gonna bring the, the number down. So if you retire early or you um, are unemployed, that's gonna bring the number down. Um, and you see a negative relationship here. Um, what this implies is if you increase taxes by 10% of income, you would lose about 80 hours of work for an individual for a year. That's like two weeks of vacation. Um, more convincing evidence might be to look at did countries that had bigger increases in tax rates over time have larger declines in hours? And there the relationship is a little bit less tight, but, but the slope of the line summarizing the points is pretty similar. And if you do a regression using all the years of data, um, you, you actually get a statistically significant estimate of this. So there is a negative correlation between which countries had the biggest tax increases and which countries had the biggest declines in hours, okay? It's not perfect, right? You can see Sweden, they kept working really hard despite big increases in taxes. Um, so what is that, if that were really the causal effect of taxes on work effort, what would that imply? Well, it's actually not that big of an effect. It really implies a 10% increase in the tax rate, say from 30% to 33%, would reduce hours worked by about 1.7%. If it reduced hours worked by about 10%, we'd be on the wrong side of the Laffer curve and cutting taxes would actually bring in revenue. We're a long way from that. Um, the cost of raising $1 more of tax revenue would be about $1.15, including the hidden costs that come from people changing their behavior, if that was really a causal effect. However, there are all sorts of reasons, you know, alternative explanations for that relationship that might suggest the effect is even smaller. So one thing that's been pointed out is you know, what's going on in Europe is unions pushed hard for mandatory vacation and the 35-hour work week and stuff like this. They were out in the streets picketing for this. And, you know, they didn't say they were doing this because of the crushing burden of taxes. They said, you know, their slogan was um, uh, work less, work all, which was basically the idea that uh, if people worked fewer hours, it would open up more jobs, right? So, so maybe it's just a coincidence, uh, this relationship. So the other uh, striking fact in the economy that some people point to as possibly suggesting a, a negative economic effect of taxes is the fact that inequality has increased a lot. So the share of income going to the top 1% of the income distribution, you can see um, jumped quite a bit there uh, from about 8% in the um, 70s all the way up to about 18%. And that coincided with a big cut in marginal tax rates on these people from you know, over 50% down to about 28% after 1986. And some people have argued, well, this is evidence that when you cut tax rates, people are gonna take efforts to earn more income. And that would imply that there's some economic cost to high taxes on the rich. We don't really see a similar thing going on in the rest of the top one, top 10%. Okay, so outside the top 1%, but in the top 10%, there's almost no change in income despite a sizable tax cut. So there's something special about the top 1%. Um, we also see a relationship across countries. So the, the horizontal axis on this graph tells us the change in the top marginal tax rate in the income tax in, in various countries. And the vertical axis tells us how much the share of income going to the top 1% change. And you can see the US is a big outlier there, but there's kind of a downward slope. Con um, countries that cut their taxes more um, did have bigger increases in incomes at the top. Um, so some people have argued that this implies 
that uh, taxes are economically costly, right? If we lower taxes, the rich earn more income. Um, you know, that cross-country relationship would imply something like the economic cost of raising another dollar tax revenue from a top bracket taxpayer would be about a buck fifty, and the peak of the Laffer curve, the revenue maximizing rate would be about 57%. However, there's so many other reasons why top incomes might have gone up, many of which you spend a lot of time thinking about, and just probably occurred to you already. So technology is changing in a way that favors very highly skilled people. Globalization is enabling highly skilled people to market their skills across the whole globe. Um, uh, executive compensation, compensation issues loom large. Um, uh, a lot of high income people are paid in stock options and financial markets boomed. Um, there's the issue of because top personal tax rates went way down, there's now incentive to shift income from the corporate tax base to the personal tax base. So part of what's going on is really not an increase in income at all. It's just change in where it's reported. So it's not a real change in income. Um, and changes in tax avoidance and evasion, which have real costs. Paying tax lawyers involves some economic cost. But we could get rid of that cost by getting rid of loopholes and instead of just abandoning tax progress. OK, so just briefly, um, some things that suggest that it's not all, you know, cutting taxes on the rich don't lead to huge positive economic benefits. The periods in history in the US when we had the highest economic growth happened to also be the 1950s and 1960s when we had the highest tax rates on high income people. Now that may just be a coincidence, but that doesn't favor the um, cutting taxes produces huge economic benefits hypothesis. Similarly, across countries, there's little relationship between the size and the cut of top marginal rates and GDP growth per capita. Um, and this leads uh, Piketty, Sayaz, and Stancheva to argue that maybe the rise in top income shares is partly um, rent seeking, where it's really, for example, executives are redistributing to themselves from shareholders who might be outside of the top 1% through uh, you know, urging their friends on the board to give them higher pay and negotiating harder now that they have a strong incentive to do so because of low taxes. <coughs> um, my own research has looked at what the occupations of people in the top 1% are. And we did this by um, utilizing the information that people write on their own tax returns on their occupations. And it's a, it's a complicated graph, but what we show is that bottom blue line is executives, managers, and supervisors, and some entrepreneurs. The red line is finance. And what we see is a huge portion of the increase in top income shares comes from those two professions. And that has very much to do with things like executive compensation and the booming stock market, maybe not about taxes. Another thing is that, so this is a spaghetti graph. This basically shows the income growth for different professions among people in the top 1%. And it's all over the place despite the fact that all these people face the same tax cut. So the, the red line there is people in finance. They have the fastest growth. Blue line is people in real estate. This ends in 2005. There are obvious other reasons why their incomes went up so much besides a tax cut. Um, you know, whereas you see, for example, lawyers didn't, you know, they did pretty well, but not that well. And you know, if it, if it was all about tax cuts, you might have expected everybody's incomes to go up. Um, so I guess what I'd say is there's a lot of uncertainty here about the evidence, but there's not a real slam dunk case that there's really strong <laughs> negative ac economic effects of taxes. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, we now move on to uh, Peter Linder who's a professor at uh, University of California, Davis, and works with the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, it's exciting for me to introduce Peter Linder because I was once aspiring to be a naval architect at MIT, and I walked into a class with a man named Charles Kindleberger. And Charles Kindleberger's textbook was co-authored with a guy named Linder. And this is what inspired me to get involved in the uh, economy, and as a result, not so many ships are sinking because they have better naval architects than I ever would have been. Uh, when I go into a bookstore these days, I see so much argument about ideology that I wish they would just pick up the whole economic section and move it into fiction. I think that would be a more honest characterization. But one uh, contrary notion uh, that contradicts my inclination was Peter's book, Growing Public, which I think was a large underpinning of Jeff Madrick's own book, The Case for Big Government. 
and it was a very thorough and deep exploration of the role of the different forms of public expenditure in the, uh, in the creation of economic outcomes. And it's, it's, I would put it as one of the 10, my favorite 10 best books that I've read since 2000 uh, on, the, on the questions of politics and economics. So I'm very excited to hear what you have to say today, Peter. Please take the stage. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and thanks to Jeff and the Center and the Institute for all of this opportunity. This is uh, fascinating, important work. You can see the title that I was basically assigned from the mandate for this section. Uh, Jan has helped out quite a bit. I have only 15 minutes. Fasten your seatbelts. I'm hoping Alant can, uh, I'm looking, and I'm hoping Alant Pritchett can um, carry on in a way that I know he can do extremely well. Okay. Uh, very quickly, here are the, the two sets of questions implied by my title. First, the one that uh, John has already given you some help on, and I can shorten my remarks as a result. It's what I have in the past called the free lunch puzzle. When you compare actual existing practices of real countries rather than theories, there is no clear net loss of GDP per capita from a welfare state. That's zero on that one particular front. Notice that in the process, let's not get carried away with the GDP growth sweepstakes here. In the process, with that same result as in more uh, free market, uh, low budget countries, they improved equality of income and they improved life expectancy. Okay, my second question that I'll go after here is why is there a tie game, more or less, zero net GDP cost as far as we can tell between the social policies of across the Atlantic. And um, I, I'll try to identify, now focusing not on the tax side that John covered so well, but on the expenditure side to talk about particular programs, some of which are pluses for the United States, some of which are social programs that are uh, pluses for the welfare state. Okay, and over the decades, not just in the, in the times post-war time spans that John covered, but also more generally over um, any time since the late 19th century. You can take the two dozen uh, best uh, data supplying countries and look at their experience, pick your time period, pick your sets of countries as long as it's pretty well capturing the uh, sample available. And here's what you get in terms of the correlations between say social spending. Now I have shifted the discussion to just what's spent on like social type programs. That's my narrower focus than the, the total government of the conference here. Uh, between that as a share of GDP and the level of GDP per person. Or growth rate, pick a growth rate either way. There is no relationship. It doesn't happen that way. And I've seen people sort of excitedly tell me, oh, didn't you realize what's been happening lately where all the welfare states are growing slower? Not true. I've been keeping up to the latest data and it's not true. For example, if you looked in the spirit of John's remarks too, at a recent cross country where I'm looking at social spending on the vertical axis, sort of a welfare state indicator, and GDP per capita, who's richer than whom on the horizontal axis, show me the big negative relationship. Uh, it's in the raw, it's positive, even if you threw away the Mexican observation, wouldn't matter, it's, it's positive. And I want to add two uh, dimensions to that, the first, uh, Jan already uh, uh, scooped uh, because he was talking about how econometrically it gets very difficult. You can't randomize the experiment uh, between um, a welfare state control group of 400 countries and 400 countries given libertarian placebos. Uh, you can't do that kind of thing. Uh, but you have to mess with the actual historical data as all those studies that he cited and that I've cited did. It gets rough. It does not really come out that you get uh, a negative relationship when you've controlled for other variables. For people like uh, the authors he did cite who tried to squeeze out that negative result, I would um, urge on them and all scholars two important steps towards transparency. One, put your data and your equations online for us all, please. That is not done by these studies as far as I know. Two. Tell us who funded your study. Don't have to say anything further, just tell us, okay? 
Okay, now from that positive graph, like Jan, I say don't conclude that there's positive evidence in favor of a welfare state because there can be reverse causation. We know that as these societies, especially de uh, democratic societies, get richer, they tend to um, uh, prefer more of uh, that kind of uh, basic safety net support. But still, even if you, if you just look at this basic fact of history, it's only rich countries that have the welfare states. Look what strong tide the conservative has to swim against here. Oh, it's bad for them. It's really bad for their growth. And as they get richer, they do more of it. This is some kind of cocaine addiction that somehow just goes on and on as you get richer. It's, it's a tough, strained argument, empirically. Okay. But you may still say, wait a minute, haven't I heard that there's a trade-off in all this? Wasn't, didn't economics tell us there was a trade-off between efficiency and equality? And my answer is no. There is such a thing as a frontier. That is to say, we can always imagine a set of policies for which you had to either choose one at the expense of the other. No country's on that frontier. Everybody has passed up basically free lunches in, the, in this uh, two-dimensional um, set of goals. And we know why they've passed them up, because basically, ask yourself, can you think of a country that thought of every possible way to improve both growth and equality, and they did it? That's not my view of the real political process in any country. Everybody, because their political process will serve the interest of some growth blocking group, uh, much more than others, you'll always get these free lunches being passed up. Okay, so then the second kind of question that I'm after, how does it come about that we get this kind of negative result when comparing real countries? There's a balance, as I say here, uh, between the growth advantages of real world social alternatives. I want to stress that some of these are ones advantage USA and some of them are advantage welfare states. The USA is not a welfare state in my comparative perspective. Okay. Let's learn from these in the positive ways you can. First of all, advantage USA. The USA has a social sector on which it has spent a great deal of public money, and we shine in that uh, in international perspective over a long history. This is the education sector. The interesting thing about it, as you can read, is that this is the social sector that is closest to being one for which a market solution works. All you have to do, really, is subsidize the sector partly because it creates knowledge and has externalities. Let private uh, action be a very large share of the total. That's higher education. That works. And also, let them compete with each other, these providers, these suppliers of higher education. We do that beautifully. That's why this is such an export product for this country. In my favorite example, Berkeley has to compete if it wants good students, good faculty, outside grants. It has to compete against public UCLA as well as private Stanford. We do that extremely well. Uh, we are the best. Before this in history, this is now fading somewhat, we led the whole world, as uh, Jeff Madrick's book has also pointed out, on um, the case for big government, in uh, primary education. We were the leaders from the get-go. And it was always interesting that the Americans initiated the idea of using the property tax uh, as a way of funding this. Okay, we need to defend that in uh, education against two uh, alternatives that I'll con restrict to higher the higher education case. Um, first, we have to restrict it against the, uh, we have to fight against the uh, movement to uh, cut Pell Grants uh, because they are both but cut, because cutting them is both a growth restrictor and regressive um, in terms of uh, the income distribution. We also, on the other hand, watch for this. We need to resist calls for universally free higher education for those who pass the entrance exams. That model is done in Brazil and other countries. It's regressive, it's elitist, and it's not particularly productive uh, the way they do it. Okay, so uh, in the case of the Pell Grant, uh, we are going backwards uh, with policies of that sort. Advantage welfare states. Oh, let me go back, by the way, just uh, uh, another th uh, comment on this in the uh, spirit of uh, Jeff's book. We gave uh, a lot of money, public money, to universities, some. Um, 
you should note in the spirit of his book that Harvard and Yale were land-grant institutions from the get-go, getting money from the governments of their colonies. That's how they got started. Later, when Harvard was finally thrown out by the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts from further subsidies, and we passed the Morrill Act, setting up land-grant institutions all across the land, Charles Eliot of Harvard complained that the Morrill Act was, quote, restricting our basic American freedoms, unquote. That may sound familiar. Um, advantages welfare states. Uh, there's a basic principle why you should be doing the egalitarian kinds of things that they do for the sake of growth. Um, the principle is that there, it's capital market imperfections. The poor cannot borrow. And no capital market institutions have ever been devised whereby privately you can simply borrow the money for your education and pay it back 40 years from now. It never works that way. And for the poor in particular who don't have the inside funds, they, can't, they have no other options. So particularly for the poor and the young, we need to do this. Among the young, especially for the earliest education, the work by Cañero and Heckman and their co-authors shows that the earlier the developmental health or educational intervention in a child's life, the higher the rate of return. Those things will give you a movement in the right direction. So advantage welfare states, not us. Uh, in public health coverage for those under 65. This is the Achilles heel of our system. On the screen I said the Achilles heel of Medicare. Well, in fairness to Medicare, I should say it's the Achilles heel of what led to Medicare, which was in the 1940s and 50s, we fatefully set up this employer-based subsidized system which created the p most powerful possible lobby against any reforms since then. And it led to Medicare because the elderly said, hey, if your insurance is tied to your job, what, about, what have we got? So um, things uh, have helped a little bit since then, and if the Supremes were somehow willing, um, the, even the Affordable Care Act of 2010 will help uh, repair these things, give us better growth as well as uh, more equality. There, we need to think towards the young. Let me try, I have to be quick. Um, about policy, shifting our policies toward the young, not toward the elderly as such, um, because We've done such a good job, relatively, of solving the problem of poverty among the elderly relative to poverty among children of uh, single moms in particular. And uh, we have a bias in our social spending, like four other countries, three other countries, all of which are in trouble now, uh, toward the elderly. Uh, and this has the least productive uh, growth consequence. If we will look for a better system, I won't have time to get into it, but you can, in fact, depoliticize the issue of, say, pensions uh, by going with a Swedish system which they give the name notional defined contribution. It automatically adjusts pensions to life expectancy and to GDP. I'd be happy to elaborate. Two other advantages, welfare state, finally. Uh, early child development. We haven't lost this race yet, but the race is on and others are stepping up uh, preschool quite a bit as fast as we. I've been watching the data lately. We're not behind yet, but this is a big issue. You can see from that econometric work by Heckman and others. And then finally, uh, what I have uh, commented on many times in the past, human investments in mother's careers. It's a simple way of creating human capital formation to have career continuity and uh, so that you keep your job and you keep forming human capital where it is most formed, which is on the job. Uh, the Nordics do a far better job of this than we. Our 1993 uh, Parental Leave Act is way too modest. Uh, we do very little on this front, and you can see it in the data on the uh, productivity of uh, mothers in particular. So those are the options. We could have green arrow options if we had the political will. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I had the opportunity to talk with Lamp uh, Pritchett from the Kennedy School of Government just in the 10 minutes or so uh, prior to uh, when we started. I was uh, drawn to a quote from the Princeton uh, professor of history, Harold James, who does a lot of study on uh, Germany in the Weimar period and has written some very powerful recent books on the globalization cycle. One that I'll cite from is called uh, The Creation and Destruction of Value. 
In the uh, discussion of the current financial crisis, he states that financial crisis create assessments of the future that form the basis of monetary valuations, and in that time of crisis, they change very quickly. And the inability to put correct prices on assets leads to a breakdown in confidence in markets. Banks, businesses, and others no longer trust each other. The effect on social cohesion is devastating. Collapsing values have a spillover effect which intensifies the process of disintegration. They fundamentally alter immaterial values as well. Hence, the collapse becomes a story of changing values in both the usual sense of the term and in the monet as monetary and ideal values are shaken. He then goes on to say, the systemic crisis leads to an elimination of political institutions that lack legitimacy or cannot accommodate the new stresses and expectations. But more often, political institutions have a different pathology and instead of fading away, become maligned, dysfunctional, and at times aggressive. This question of how governance endogenously responds to crisis and to the yearning for order among people can lead to various different forms of government and various different, uh, how do you say, innovations and outcomes that can affect us very powerfully. Uh, Lent, uh, please join us in uh, he, I, as he's walking up, I'll just uh, recite, he's the uh, co-editor of the Journal of Development Economics. He's worked many years at the World Bank, worked very closely with Larry Summers when he was a vice president there, and has been a very important author of many of the World Development Report uh, projects over the years. Thanks for joining us. So um, I've always been told one of the key elements of being a speaker is to speak about something you know more about than the rest of the audience, um, which sometimes drives me some form to talk about my family, because I'm reasonably <laughs> confident, as long as my wife's not in the room, uh, I'll be good on that. Um, here I have to say I, I have never, in a professional capacity, engaged in any issue in the U.S. economy. I took a civics class in high school. American citizen, I've never actually specialized in the U.S. economy, but I'm a specialist in the growth rates and phenomena in develop in the rest of the world, in the, particularly in the poor world. So I'm going to give a slightly different perspective on government and what we kind of tend to discover from studies of how government works and the impact of government on growth, which tends to be a sort of reinforcing but in some ways different perspective on the issue of taxation and regulation. So the, the first point is that um, the, the, the basic thing that I learned from Peter Lindert uh, is that there's a big problem with any assertion about the connection between taxes and long-run growth. And that is the long-run growth of the United States has been exactly the same for 120 years. So if I had given you data about the growth rate of the United States economy between 1890 and 1901, and you had done the simplest possible regression extrapolation to predict GDP per capita in the United States in 2003, that far right shows the difference between the predicted value and the actual value, which, it, which means <laughs> there has been absolutely zero change in the long run growth rate of the United States over a period of 120 years in which the taxation rate and the fraction of GDP going to social expenditures and all other expenditures has gone up by several factor multiples. So if there were any net deteriorating effect of higher levels of government taxation, we've had plenty of opportunity to see it and it's just not there. And moreover, this is kind of true in the rest of the world too. So here's exactly the same figure for Denmark, exactly the same calculation, which is let's use data from before the 20th century began to predict what GDP in Denmark would be in 2003. And again, you might think, oh, economists, they can never predict anything. They're always wrong. Well, turns out we're wrong over the short run. But over the long run, there's been absolutely no change in the growth rate in Denmark over a period which, again, Peter Lender's work documents conclusively that, you know, total taxation and total um, 
uh, spending as a percent of GDP has just skyrocketed. I mean, gone up factor multiples, if not an, an order of magnitude, right, Peter? I mean, an order of magnitude. So again, you know, the basics of science is if this changes, does this change? What we've seen is one thing go up by a factor of 10 and one thing remain unchanged. Kind of just to first order, it just doesn't make any sense to talk about there being, there just can't be big negative effects or we would have found them by now by running, because after all, one of the things is, well, maybe you just haven't changed it enough. Well, you know, this is changed by an order of magnitude factor 10. It just can't be true. So, you know, we can, we can predict almost perfectly. I forgot I had these cute bills in there. Okay, so I want to talk about something else, which is growth policy in a deals world. And I first have to tell you what I think a deals world is. Um, and then the, the, the real problem in the rest of the world, uh, the real problem, again, you can extrapolate everything I say in any way you want to the United States, but I don't know anything about the United States, so. Um, but weak institutions, when you have weak institutions, you're living in a deals world, not the world that economists usually think about, which is a rules world. And the problem is once you're in a deals world, what promotes growth may weaken institutions, and then you can get into a very negative dynamic. So the first thing I want to talk about is what do I mean by capability for implementation, and what do I mean by the difference between de jure and de facto policy? And I'll just use a really simple example because it's something we've all had experience with. And we can contrast kind of your experience in the United States and what studies show of an experience in India, which is, say you want to get a driver's license. We all know how you get a driver's license in the United States. You go down to the DMV, you wait in line, some people are rude to you, you follow some procedures, and eventually you get a driver's license, right? Now, some friends of mine did the study of how you get a driver's license in New Delhi. Well, it turns out in New Delhi, when you go to the driver's license building, before you get to the line, there are a group of people called touts. And these touts say, for a modest fee, I will facilitate the process of your getting a driver's license. Well, then it turns out that the policy in India for getting a driver's license looks exactly like the policy for getting a driver's license in the United States. You have to prove how old you are, you have to prove where you live, and then you have to take a driving test. That's the policy. Well, what turns out? Once you pay the tout, well, of the people who hired an agent to facilitate the transaction, only about 12% of them, well, 12% of them, actually took the legally required driving exam. Of the people that didn't hire an agent, 90% had to take the legally required driving exam. Okay, so what's the policy for getting a driver's license in India? Well, if I describe the legal policy, blah, 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 well, the real policy is hire a tout, get a license. Now, of course, I, I find this <clears throat> study hilarious because it's done by some colleagues of mine at Harvard and MIT, and I lived in India, and I had a driver who was illiterate because he never went to school. Uh, he knew how to get a driver's license in India. <laughs> he didn't need to do an experiment to know. Because um, when he came to me, he said, I need to get a driver's license. I need 3,000 rupees. I said, is that how much a driver's license costs? I thought the fees would be very low. He says, well, you can either give me 3,000 rupees or I can take two weeks off work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, here's 3,000 rupees. He came back with the driver's license. Um, now, the final sort of interesting part of this is that they actually tested the driving skills. You might say, well, more power to them. They're getting around this stupid red tape anyway. Well, what they did is they hired a firm to test whether the people who got the licenses by hiring an agent and not taking the driving exam could drive. Well, the study didn't quite work out because the people who taught driving in Delhi who they hired to test the people wouldn't get in the car with the people who had a driver's license <laughs> because they couldn't tell them which pedal stopped the car. So it wasn't like this was just innocuous, well, you know, you're getting around red tape faster by having a tout. You're actually subverting the underlying public purpose of the law. So that's the simple example. So what do I mean by weak institutions? Well, in this case, I mean weak institutions of policy implementation mean the gap between the policy is written and the policy is implemented is complete. In the United States, at least with driver's licenses, most people have to do what the law says to get a driver's license. Now, this moves on to sort of the growth part in the sense that I worked with the World Bank and the World Bank is this wonderfully disorganized place which means it often does things it didn't mean to do. So what the World Bank did is they went out <laughs> and they did a huge number of studies around the world and the number of days it would take a business to get a construction permit 
if they followed the law. Now the beauty of it is they all sent out a different group that weren't talking to the other group that measured the number of days that firms that got a construction permit said it took them. So you can ask, is there any connection between the number of days the law says it would take you to get a, to get a construction permit and the number of days it actually took you to get a construction permit? And this scatter plot, if there were complete compliance, all of these little country abbreviations should be on that 45 degree line. Well, you know, you don't need any sophisticated econometrics to know those aren't on the 43 degree line. And basically what this shows you, I'm going to move away from my mic, but what this shows you is that as the number of days to get a license goes from 100 to 200 to 300 to 400, the average days it takes to get a license doesn't change at all. Basically, you know, once your capability of enforcing the law breaks down, because this is the, the, the title of the study is that we say is um, what's, the, what's the effect of the business climate when everybody has climate control, right? Ask yourself, what's the, what's the average temperature in Boston versus Phoenix? Well, you might say it's really hot in Phoenix and it's really cold, you know, it's really cold in Boston. Well, then ask yourself, what's the average lived temperature in Boston or Phoenix? It's exactly the same. We're all inside. We all have climate control, right? The actual lived temperature of businesses is exactly the same no matter what the law says because they're inside. What are the inside? Well, well the other thing, the study of actually asking individual firms how long it took is we could compare the differences across firms, okay? So this picture is just wonderful but too complicated to understand. So I'll show you the next picture right away. This, <laughs> So, because what this next picture illustrates um, a saying that's attributed to various Latin American presidents, for my friends, anything. For my enemies, the law. <laughs> so once the law is sufficiently restrictive, I don't need to punish you. All I need to do is allow you to evade the law and I've rewarded you and I don't need to like go out of my way to punish my enemies. I just have to say, oh, I'd love to facilitate your business, but you really do have to comply with the environmental processes of regulations, and that will take you three years. To my friends, anything. So what we do is we look at the days. This is the same thing. This is how many legal days it should take you to get a construction permit. The top box is what the 10% of firms in all countries who reported the fastest time said it took them. The reason you can't see the country names is it's nothing. So 10% of firms in every country, when you ask them how long it took to get a construction permit, they said four days. And they said four days when the law said 10 days, and they said four days when the law said 100 days, and they said 10, four days when the law said 300 days. There was just no connection. The 25th percentile of firms by how fast they said they got a construction permit, exactly the same thing. How long did it take you to get a construction permit? It was about eight days, and it was about eight days of the law said 100 days, about eight days of the law said 400 days, okay? So there's a set of people where you ask them, how hard is the government regulatory environment blowing? They'll go, I don't know, I'm a submarine. Who cares how hard the wind's blowing on the surface of the water? I'm already inside a system that's completely exempted me from the effect of any of these laws. So, what this means is um, when we look at then, let's say we, and this is a terrible figure. This is just awful. Um, but if they post this on a website and you have time to figure it out, it will change your life to understand it. But, um, <laughs> but basically what this says is what happens if we have deregulation and we reduce the number of days it takes? What's the effect on the number of days businesses actually report? Well, if you were moving along the line of compliance, these arrows should all be pointing downward along this line. Now, all of these arrows show what happened to compliance times as the regulations liberalized. Nearly always, times firms reported taking went up, not down. So there's just, okay, so now, so basically, there's several, there's several kind of, so 
when the state capability for policy implementation is broken down, it's no longer a rules world, it's a deals world. What do I mean by a rules world? Well, a rules world is everybody gets a driver's license the same way. What's a deals world? It depends on what you do. It's a deal. Are you going to be able to build your factory? Who are you? You going to be able to build your factory? What are you going to give me? Now, the second, when you're in a deals world, <laughs> the rules cease to matter. It's what's the deal available to you. Now, the third thing is that these deals worlds can create pr really perverse situations in which movement to worse governments rapidly accelerates growth. And more, but the problem is that acceleration of growth leads to precisely the quote from James, which I love to find because it's a perfect quote. It leads to these negative feedback loops in which the same mechanisms that accelerate growth in the long run destroy legitimacy in the, in, in the short run, destroy legitimacy in the long run, because you can succeed in creating growth by creating profitable opportunities for people being inside the bubble of protection. But how do you do that? You do that by undermining the rule of law. Because the only way you can successfully promise to people that they will be exempt from the effects of regulation is to destroy the autonomous capability of the organizations implementing the regulation to mess with you. So um, I have, so if you think about kind of what happens in the world is there's a set of regimes where the state capability for policy implementation is high, which means they have high autonomous civil servants, they had good, what we would call good governments, and those good governments can pursue a whole variety of regulations with no impact on growth. Then what we have is countries that circle around inside these deals environments, moving from what I call closed order deals to open order deals, and from, clo from closed to open, and I thought I had a slide, oh shoot, lost a slide, oh, anyway, I'm, I don't, I'm running out of time anyway. But basically, this is really simple. Think of, think of China. China, not a good government particularly, doesn't la have a good, solid, autonomous, rules behaving, civil service things, but it's growing really fast. Why? Because I'm 100% sure that when I cut a deal with the Chinese government, the deal stays cut. Doesn't get disrupted by pesky labor movement, doesn't get disrupted by pesky, pesky things, deal stays cut. So I can make a lot of profits. That's what I call a closed order deal. I know who the deal makers are, I know how to get them, and once I make that deal, that deal is ordered. It, there's no uncertainty about it. The problem is, and what that means is that if you look at sort of the quality of government and the level of output, you see that rich countries have good institutions. But if you look at the rate of growth and the, and the, <laughs> the quality of government, you see the countries with the best institutions don't necessarily grow the fastest, the fastest growing countries are actually countries with crappy governments. But the slowest growing countries are the countries with crappy governments too. Because what's the alternative to closed order deals? It's disordered deals, where I don't know what's gonna happen. So I get an environment where I don't have stable good governments, don't have capable bureaucracies, don't have the capability of the state to enforce the rule of law. And when that's chaos, I get low growth. But if I move to a talk, authoritarian governments of same crappy quality, but which really work to enforce the, the deals that are cut, you can get super rapid economic growth. The problem is that economic growth itself exists on the premise that <coughs> it subverts the independent rule of law, the independent implementation of regulation by capable states. So it subverts the state to promote growth. So closed order deals tend to start happy as you move from disordered to ordered, growth takes off. So Suharto in Indonesia, Indonesia had chaos for 10 years, Suharto came in, you knew who you had to do business with. And if you did business with him, he did good business. 30 years of growth, actually 30 years of really rapid poverty reduction, 30 years of lots of good, kind of goodish stuff, but boy do they end sad. Because once they end, they have subverted the existence. They haven't built capability of the state through the process of economic growth. They've subverted the very capability 
of the state to implement the rule of law. So when the authority of the person or regime disappears, you're back in disorder, and only when you can reconstitute order can you come back to growth. I'll quit there. Right to left. Oh, oh, um, uh, just maybe a quick supplement on something John said. Or, or, do I have to go? Oh, okay, right. anyway, John's case. Um, by the way, in the uh, international data sets that he used, as well as in um, some other indices that are out there, watch out for the data on Singapore. First of all, Singapore is not a participant in the OECD High, High Data Standards Club note. Um, Singapore has two well-known attributes. They preach uh, private enterprise. They're somewhere to the right of America's Republicans. Uh, and they have had fast growth. Good news, it would seem, for a certain lobby. Uh, Singapore, uh, as is never mentioned in these data, so uh, this includes, I believe, the data on government revenue. The government owns four-fifths of the land. That's off budget, I believe. The government also forces you to save money for your retirement, the so-called Central Provident Fund, which they proceed to use. Uh, it's not clear that you ever actually get it back. You certainly don't have the right to pull it out. Um, so this is the free market Singapore in the, in the data sets. <laughs> okay, an audience uh, right here. Uh, very interesting. Stop. Uh, thanks. I'm Akbar Noman, Columbia University. Very interesting land. Um, you know, what, but you, yes, it's true that if you bypass regulations with institutional deal making, you create growth and undermine institutions. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you're a richer society, you can afford some of these institutions better. I mean, you know, because part of the reason why your institutions are weak is because the public goods the poor countries can't afford. They can't afford to pay their lawyers and judges well enough. So as you get richer, you are able to afford more of the good institutions. The two kind of offsetting tendencies there. Yeah. No, why don't we keep, why don't we take a number of questions and then take a, mm -hmm. I mean, let him get it out of the system. <laughs> Uh, I had a, a question for Professor Bakia. I was wondering, you know, you seem to demonstrate pretty conclusively that that uh, there's no evidence that taxes uh, restrict economic growth. And so I was wondering why people think that taxes restrict economic growth. Well, people don't know anything about evidence, typically, right? I mean, who, who looks at data? That's boring. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a, I think there's a myth that like the 1980s were a miraculous growth period that had no better growth than the 90s or the 70s. You know, it, it was pretty much like Lance said, it's just growth has been the same pretty much. I mean, it was a little bit better in the 90s. It was very good in the 50s and 60s. But aside from that, you know, maybe the 50s and 60s were just catch up from the Great Depression. So as your chart suggests, so. Well, no, there are studies, right? I mean, I've seen how the sausage of econometrics is, is made, right? And, you know, you, you, you pick the right set of control variables and you can prove a lot of things quite frequently. So there are studies out there that show government has a bad effect on growth, but you change it a little bit, make a reasonable change that's hard to argue with, and you don't find government hurts growth. So, you know, like I, like I said, I mean, I think in a lot of areas of ec economics, we're moving more towards trying to find things that are more like experiments. It's just so hard to do that with this particular question. But just to make this clear yeah. to a more yeah. general audience, we read yeah. all the time from yeah. economists from prestigious universities mm -hmm. that high taxes mm -hmm. reduce work effort, reduce growth, that social welfare welfare yeah. states reduce growth. So your suggestion that people don't look at data is not quite... Well, that's fair. I mean, you started to address it, but let's mm -hmm. try and make this for the general audience. What the heck's going on here? You can't find a relationship. Peter can't find these relationships. Yeah. And yet you read the, the Wall Street Journal editorial page and they're finding relationships Well, what they, what the they point they to, have, what they agree. point to is the kind of data I showed, like the negative relationship between hours worked and tax rates. That's something like Ed Prescott will say on the pages of the Wall Street Journal, or they'll point to the large increase in incomes at the top and say that was a burgeoning of entrepreneurial effort in response to cutting tax rates. So what they're leaving out is critical thinking. What are all the other possible explanations 
for that pattern that we see in the data. And you know, in the Wall Street Journal editorial page, they're not going to bring those topics up. John, John, I, sorry, I think your answer is being too charitable. <laughs> um, most of these studies, and see my yeah. the very shortened. I have a sort of paper on the see the shortened thing I put in the nation that was just distributed to you here. Um, most of them aren't using data. When they say that a professor found this, okay, <laughs> d no, didn't find it, didn't show it, as in my phrase chose to imagine it. <laughs> this is re reverse engineering. I like this result. Let me back up and see if I can generate some parameters without data and without tests. Now, so f certainly for everything Prescott did in the subject, yeah. what I just said is true. Yeah. Is there some place in this discussion for the word self-interest? Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> but like, can, can, I, can I make a, yeah. a, a, a different interpretation in part of this, which is and I think this goes importantly to what Peter is saying, which is I actually think the aggregate economists shouldn't have views about the aggregate tax take or aggregate expenditure for the following reason, which is a lot of what goes through government I think is properly classified as compulsory purchase. Now, when you have compulsory purchase, in a market that otherwise wouldn't have existed because of moral hazard or adverse selection that would eliminate a market, you actually can have everybody paying exactly the price they perfectly would have been willing to pay had the market existed, have all that money flow through the government and come back to citizens, and have it look like high rates of taxation when in fact the true taxation component is very tiny. Let me, let me give an example. People actually hate uncertainty in their income. So people would prefer to buy insurance on their income. But th what's the problem with that? Well, I can only sell you insurance on events that are unpredictable and not under your control. So I can sell you fire insurance because you won't burn down your own house while you're in it and you'll take adequate care. I can't, as a private insurer, sell you insurance on your income. Why? because people who are lazy will buy it, and people who aren't lazy won't. That's called adverse selection. So the market for income insurance disappears, even though people would love to have it. So the government comes along and says, everybody has to pay a fee into an unemployment pool, and it's compulsory. So I've solved the problem of adverse selection. And you could imagine that the fee everyone pays for unemployment insurance is exactly what they would be willing to pay Given the risk insurance, given the risk aversion to income fluctuations in their own income, in which case every person would be paying a price for income insurance that's exactly what they would be willing to pay. So there's no analytical tax component. Because a tax is the difference between what you'd be willing to pay and what you have to pay mm -hmm. due to compulsion of the government. So actually, compulsory purchase creates what look like government expenditures but actually creates markets. And hence, the negative distortionary effects of pure taxation on labor effort shouldn't be evinced in those markets. Does that make sense? And I think this is an important, hmm? exactly, no, no, well, exactly, he, he right? And, but the, but then, the, then the analysis of tax rates has to be on the true tax component, not the compulsory purchase component, and exactly what Peter just said about Singapore. Let's say we take a, two countries, they do exactly the same thing in terms of how much you have to contribute to a pension fund and what benefits you get. One of it does it through the private sector and one of it does it through the public sector. One says, oh my god, this is a huge welfare state, and the other looks like a free market economy. But in both situations, it's roughly analytically the same thing, and only the net redistributive component of it, which is the not fair market purchase value, but what you have to pay over and above what you would have been willing to pay that gets redistributed because there's some net redistributive effect counts in terms of the economic thinking as a true tax. Mm -hmm. the, uh, from which we should expect yeah. to see distortionary effects, which I, I think is the uh -huh. theoretical solution to Peter's free lunch puzzle, uh -huh. which is the free lunch came because a huge amount of the social spending was actually just yeah. compulsory purchase. Right. And the Affordable Care Act imitates the market with a very small, uh, questionable tax component in exactly the way that Lance just described. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 
far back. Oh, thank you. Um, my question, oh, wow, uh, sorry. My question is for uh, Professor Lindert. Um, your last comment actually had me kind of wanting you to speak a little more. It was, um, we could kind of move towards a more egalitarian society using the Nordic model, or I guess implementing more Nordic uh, models of economics within our own system. And you said that we, like if, if we only had the political will of doing yes. this, that it would be possible. Now, my question is, where does that political will come from? Does it come from Congress? Does it come from the people? Does it come from professors like you all here? Or I'm just wondering that. Uh, the political will has to come from the political process. The people have a very powerful role to play in it, which others have been urging on and describing better than I. The values of the populace uh, in a democracy have to give a powerful majority to those who want these solutions. It is our bad luck <laughs> that um, we live in a country with great divisions on this matter. Um, it could be done. There's no economic reason why those things can't be done, but I'm afraid uh, you know, you follow a certain historical path and you have a certain nation to deal with. Uh, we are a wonderful nation. We certainly do not agree with each other. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Sarah Bird Sharps. I'm with the Social Science Research Council. Thanks so much for a, a thoughtful and really stimulating panel and for a really a, a great day. I had a, just a, a quick, broad comment to make, which is that I would urge, I think that for all the tables and charts and economic, uh, econometric modeling of these guys coming to certain conclusions, there are people out there who use lots of tables and charts to come to different conclusions. And I would urge the, this initiative as you move forward to hold some of your fora with people who, with who, who hold very different positions and to engage with them because I think that that strengthens our understanding of how they frame debates, our understanding of the vocabulary that they use, et cetera, and mm -hmm. therefore our ability to be effective in moving forward on this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, picking up on that note, um, it's one in that, in engaging that debate, what's interesting as an outsider, um, to the economics field is looking at the ways or listening to the ways in which many of the, you buy into many of the assumptions, right? You talk about growth, but growth is a generic, right? There's growth in China, which may be environmentally destructive where the costs will become due, coming due later versus growth, which is healthy and which is sustainable. There are, is working really hard, which I know is not an economic term of art, but in France, do people work less hard because they don't have to work, because they don't have to work to pay for daycare? And the people in the US work more hours because they have to in order to earn things. So, um, and then economically costly, you talked about something being economically costly, but to whom? Um, and then the last example was in the talk about in the India, in the India example, as you talked about India, it made me think about we do have these healthy institutions, and do, but do we really not have a deals culture in federal regulatory agencies where it's not bribery, but it's the promise of a future job to a regulator. If you play along and play the industry way, you will be, re, you will be reimbursed later. So there are lots of ways in which we assume that the ways in which mainstream economics, and I don't know where you fall in that stream, has embraced a lot of definitions which are actually in the interests of the market fundamentalists. I mean, could I just flat out disagree with that? I mean, everything you say, everything you say is perfectly well incorporated to what economists do day in and day out. It's just a caricature to think that we don't take into account all those things. Environmental, is that Yeah, I mean, I environment, we have environmentally adjusted GDP growth that we could use and use roughly the same things. And we, I mean, again, Oh, and uh, I mean, a lot of people, and a lot of people can you, you know, we can do GDP per adjusted work hour as a measure of productivity and sort of, and sort of GDP per capita. And like I say, routinely, all of these things are well recognized and well acknowledged within the economics profession. It's not like we make assumptions and don't 
recognize that there's environmental sustainable, don't recognize that some people work hard and don't work hard. I mean, and in this kind of audience, we're being simple because it's a simple, it's a simple kind of forum. But all of these things are perfectly well within the ambit I'm, of standard mainstream economics. It's not like we're ignoring <laughs> them. It's not like we assume them away. It's not like we're not aware of them. It's just I'm, not, it's just, it's just a canard. It's just not true. Yeah. I'm totally happy to embrace the idea that I'm simple when it comes to this, but, <laughs> but, no, but but to take Joe Stiglitz, and this is a very short point, in the conversation he talked about moving away from using GDP as a measure, yeah. but yeah. you all were using GDP as a measure, so why not use the Human Development Index? I'm done. Just, uh, it's partly rhetorical because uh, I, I, I would never traffic in GDP as the thing I want to maximize, but since I know there are people out there who want to hit uh, a particular social program over the head by talking about GDP, I respond on that front, that's all. Well, I think we better tie up now and I just can tell you that uh, there's one thing that I learned from this session. About six days ago, my second daughter was born, so I'm now surrounded by three girls. And I'm going home, I'm going home right after this session and I'm announcing for the next 18 years, we're having a closed order deal system. <laughs> <laughs>